Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Cordelia schmitella -O. I'm the chair of the IPA in Culture Committee and the chair of this webinar. Welcome to all of you and thank you for your interest in thinking with us about the voice of resistance in culture. Literature, art, music, photography, film, dance and theater have an important function in our life. They please surprise or disturb us. They leave us puzzled, shaken or inspired. They elicit our creativity. Other than the works of political or scientific analysis, culture reaches and affects the hearts and minds of everyone. It directly speaks to our humanity. That's why we open a book, go to a museum or watch a movie. The subtle and unpredictable power of culture is confirmed each time dictators or authoritarian regimes try to silence cultural expressions and jail their proponents. They fear their voices, their resistance. But whatever force they may use, they never succeed in squashing them because the voices of culture refuse to deny or forget, to succumb or resign. They are the genuine expressions of our mind's creativity, which from early childhood on endows the world with meaning and transcends reality with fantasy and with a hope for a better life. In six necessarily short contributions, each of the presenters in this webinar will reflect on how the voices of culture respond to and transform the experience of danger, pain, and human suffering in a creative act of resistance. What you will hear is a slightly modified version of a panel we presented last year at the IPA Congress in Cartagena under the theme, Mind in the Lion of Fire. The panelists are the members of the IPA in Culture Committee. There's only one of our members missing, Barbara Stimmel from New York, who unfortunately could not join us. For copyright reasons, we couldn't include the visual materials, which you can access again by using the links which were added to the reminder of the email to this webinar you have received today. While you listen, a thought or question may come to mind. If you want us to respond to it, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to type in whatever you want to uh, ask. And please let us also know if your name should be used or if you want to ask anonymously. But please abstain from using clinical material because this webinar will be posted on the IPA website and we haven't reminded you officially of the confidentiality of these uh, materials. We will get to all your questions at the end of this presentation. In order to leave as much time as possible for our joint discussion at the end, I will introduce the presenters only by their names and the countries they live and work in. Thus, without further ado, our first speaker is Claudia Antonelli from Brazil. Thank you, Cordelia. I'm going to speak a bit about the transformative power of literature. Literature as resistance to violence, oppression, repression, and even death. It is my understanding that the cultural act of elaborating and transforming aversive and dangerous facts of life into literary narrative constitutes one of the most invaluable human cultural acquisitions. There is the well-known story of Sherazad <clears throat> from the epic collection of, uh, sorry, just a <clears throat> there is the well-known story of Sherazad from the epic collection of Middle Eastern folk tales known as the 1001 Nights, 
nearly everyone has heard of it. More than the story, what is at stake there seems to be the function of the words in, pro in protection of life, Sherazad, her resistance against the merciless brutality of a man hurt by the betrayal of his wife at the daylight of his own castle, evoking the power of her words. Night after night, Sherazad earns a day of life. Due to her capacity to entangle the Sultan's curiosity and thirst for something he had not known until then, that is, the continuation of an interesting narrative, of a human narrative. Her method was the expression of her mind facing a reality she did not agree to kneel to. She did not want to be the next virgin woman to be sexually consumed and slaughtered at the dawn of the day after. Not exactly knowing where the tales she told would lead them both, Sherazad continued. Salman Rushdie, the great writer, has said on an interview, a woman using the power of storytelling, the power of literature to tame a brute. This woman would lay her life on the line, believing that literature would save her. By the end of the Thousand and One Nights, it's clear that he does not want anymore to kill her. Something has civilized him. It's an extraordinary image that has inspired writers forever after that, including me, says Salman Rushdie. Sherazade, in her storytelling, tells the Sultan about human feelings and affections, fear, courage, grief, envy, jealousy, pain, joy, from human relationships that she describes from out there in the world. She, spell, she spells out what he, the Sultan, cannot do or does not know of, overwhelmed by his own impossibility to think and to put into words what he feels. She helps him to wait, to long for, to restrain his own brutality. He too had learned that, that the world's borders would expand as he tore apart the veils of the visible, writes Nelly da Pignon, a Brazilian author in her own version of Sherazade, in a 2009 book called Voices of the Desert. Finally, while, while storytelling, Sherazade's plan keeps them both alive, becoming day after day, perhaps both, a little more human. And then there is Abd al-Rahman al-Dendi, a young man made a political prisoner in Egypt about two years ago, because while in a car drive with his father, Al-Dendi took pictures and filmed a protest in the streets of his hometown. He was 17 years old by then, sentenced to 15 years in prison. A New York Times journalist wrote at the time, I quote, Al-Dendi was sentenced to 15 years in prison for unlawful assembly. Once in prison, shortly after, he started writing the abuses of life in his own journal. The idea of someday publishing his memoirs gave him a reason to live, wrote Ida Lamy on March 17th, 2022. She continued, El Zendi envisioned that the end of his, the end of, at the ending of his book, the ending of his book would be inspiring, despite all the horrors he would have to recount, further wrote the journalist. Fortunately, he was able to be released earlier than expected. He kept himself alive, so he said, story writing his day in, day out, along his imprisonment. He simply wrote, I've absorbed this idea of resistance through storytelling my own story. And the journalist, he knew he didn't want his memoir to be about only pain and degradation. The idea that somehow it could also be about hope helped to ease his despair, letting him dream that all he was going through could have a meaning in the end. The thought of the book gave him an existential purpose at a time when his, 
when his life was little more than just suffering, concluded the journalist. We may conceive that Al Dendi kept his psychic life alive while creating connections between his oppressive present by then and a future in which he could tell others his story, give it a narrative, a sense, a reasoning. This is how I want readers to receive my work one day. What you are holding between your hands, this is how I survived. Said El Gendi, now 27, a student of the fine arts. Storytelling one day saved the character Sherazad and her sultan, and saved the young Egyptian El Gendi, among many others, and among many others who were not saved by any means, as we well know. Retelling a fact of life is often telling and even living it for the first time in a broader and deeper sense, once in contact with the thoughts and emotions that a sometimes ruthless experience imposes. Facts primarily without meaning, without sense, can gradually begin to take shape, thought, and be integrated into one's mind and life. This is perhaps what literature as a cultural formation attempts throughout the millions of plots, characters, and places that we read, hear, or write, be them fictional or factual. In this sense, we may consider that the classical 1001 Nights is a representative, a prototype of literature's effects alongside other cultural processes to keep our minds alive, nourished, healed, healing, resisting, and even expand, making sense and integration. I quote Nelly da Pignon one more time. Is it not true that what was lived in one's life, even if it dissolves in the midst of memories, is a point of resistance in the future? A verbal edification more powerful than any mosque or palace erected with stone, lime and sweat. At last, needless but kind to recall that also the analytic diet seems to do something similar with the until then untold or even unrepresented experiences. Analysts and their patients create unpublished literature in each session they take on. This is a thought about by our colleague Roosevelt Casola. The patient's stories, in echo with those spoken or not of the analyst, may then create new, blooming ones. A resistance to psychic death or brutal states of the mind, also called non-dream areas. While story making and telling tales of one's own humanity, even one's own brutality, overall, one's own human nature. As we know, the analyst usually wants to hear the next chapter. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Claudia, for your contribution. Our next speaker will be Valeria Ricchieri from Buenos Aires. Well, in photography, there are no shadows that cannot be illuminated. August Sander. Photos present certain dimensions that the optic nerve capture quickly. Light and shadows between colors, faces that speak to us, countless movements in a small and silent square. Images as a narrative resource ask us to discover what gave them life. They announce the comings and goings of culture, which like a turbulent sea, carry and bring the vestiges of transformation. Portraits detached from words show their ideas, revealing conflicts, grief, joy, the suffering of human sight. When I was three or four years old, I used to quietly sit and look at magazines. I was just taking my first steps with letters. These beautiful images didn't require reading. 
It was magical. One morning, I saw that image, a little girl running straight ahead incomprehensively naked, by her side, other children and soldiers also running. In the background rose a column of gray smoke that seemed to hide a terrible monster in its death. She showed pain and terror that could never go unnoticed. It was then that I learned for the first time that there were countries at war, bombs, and that there were bad people very far away who could do a lot of harm, as my parents explained to me. I think today, not so far away. It was then, on June 1972, in the village of Trang Bang, South Vietnam, 20-year-old Associated Press photographer Nick Ute immortalized one of the most iconic images of the 20th century. The Pulitzer Prize winning image was officially titled The Terror of War, but was better known as the Nampal Girl. Pan T. Kim Pook, at that time was only nine years old. She was running down a road with 65% of her body burned with no clothes on because she torn them off to free herself from the scorching effect of Nepal. That photo traveled the world and became an anti-war symbol. The path of dark colors left no time or space for curiosity. It was a brutal testimony of those historical and social events that abandoned all human ethics. It did not take long for Nick Ute to understand what this image and its diffusion meant for the whole world. The capture of what was to be silenced, the concrete knowledge of unimaginable realities, the starting point of resistance to so much destruction. He began to take a sequence of photos but as the girl got closer, he knew she would die if he didn't get her to the hospital. He did, she survived. As a war correspondent, the life between him and his camera gave him only a few seconds to decide. In spite of being so young, he already showed the integrity of his character. He understood that documentation and its art doesn't supersede the act of care. One day they would become friends. She would call him uncle. They would travel around the globe showing the legitimate and precise controversies between Eros and Thanatos. They would be two survivors with a clear message of putting an end to war by showing the painful but necessary truth. A child escapes death. A young man saves a girl and breaks the fatality of destiny to turn it into existence. This girl, now a woman, carries the scars of her wounds on her body and the scars that every war leaves on the soul. But she no longer runs naked. She now can tolerate the photo that first took her away, who first took away her dreams as it was used many times for a political propaganda. For a long time, the photo has haunted her like a phantom, as she says. It did not let me go. It was only after Canada granted Pook political asylum in 1992 that she felt inspired to use her personal tragedy for a greater good. She embraced that photo, leaving behind shame, fear, and the need to hide. She turned that image into a powerful gift to work for peace and wrote a book about her experience. She also created the Kim Foundation International, a charity that provides aid to children of war. Nick Ute continues to hold his camera even after he retired. He still believes in the power of photography, the impact and effects it has on society. 
he thinks that even if times have changed and images are now instantaneous, they are still equally powerful. However, he prefers to do things the old fashioned way, developing personally his, personally his photos, capturing and selecting the scenes that show authenticity. Now, after 15 years as a war photographer, he looks at the face in Hollywood. Although times has passed, I must say that photo did not let me go, neither as analysis, analyst, nor as a person with responsibilities in this world. Poverty, racism, war conflicts, climate changes have shown that something has gone wrong in the understanding we gave of taking care. I think of this photo and its story as a reminder of awareness we must acquire in our difficult hours, the resistance to the dark side of human nature. Sometimes I like to imagine the young man entering the dark room, anxious to be able to fulfill his task, waiting for the magic moment of revelation on the blank piece of paper, intrigued by the novelty of what will emerge, the essence of human nature. I think in a way it resembles the process of, process of analysis, the moment of unique insight ready to transmute and unveil something vital connected to life. The artist and the art photography are there to be seen, to give us clues, to decipher mysterious of how we act, feel, and think within culture. Perhaps we, like Nick Ute, are looking to bear witness, to resist, to arouse emotions, to provoke a change, to perpetuate the beauty of this world that seems to have fallen asleep and needs to wake up. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, Valeria, and I move on to our next speaker, uh, Johanna Welt from France. Uh, thank you, um, Cordelia, for giving me uh, uh, the turn. So um, I'm going to speak about a photographer, Nan Goldwyn. So uh, I've entitled my text, uh, Phot Photographic uh, Revelation. So um, I was deeply moved by Laura Poitras' documentary film, uh, which is uh, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. Uh, it was released last year, and it was about the artist photographer Nan Goldin and her struggle during the opioid crisis. To me, it was an unexpected re revelation, a shock. First, the beauty of the world revealed in photographs of ordinary life, but not so ordinary. Nan first photographed her school friends. Then the people of the night. She went to live in a community in 1972 in New York. She photographed the Manhattan underground, straight, gay, by young, old, beautiful, ugly couples, in particular, in particular her drag queen and trans friends, sublimated depictions presented in a book entitled The Other Side. And in an interview in 2020, she says, the conversation about trans issues is different these days. Trans people are much less segregated. So in her work, uh, there's people, there's Nan, there's photo of them by her and photos of her by them. She portrays herself in the sometimes devastated lives of these ordinary heroes who struggle and struggle against drugs, prostitution, the streets, madness and violence, including domestic violence. She openly testifies 
that she has been in gay and heterosexual relationships, that she has taken drugs and been a prostitute. She takes a picture of herself after being beaten up for the nth time by her husband. So it's a way for her to denounce battered woman. But above all, it's a testimony that she offers to herself so that she doesn't relapse and go back to her husband. Then she will divorce him. She also gives voice to these people we don't know through her stunningly beautiful photos. She is part of their world. She shows that world. She shows life, sexuality, and desire. She denounces the failures of the Ed's years, the friends who have disappeared, the suffering long denied by society, the skinny bodies that are going to die. Later, in 2017, Nan became involved in the fight against the Sackler family, a family of wealthy patrons who marketed oxycodone and unethically enriched themselves to the detriment of addicted patients. Loha Poitras films Nan using her celebrity as an artist to oppose the hypocrisy hypocrisy of this family, which uses its dirty money to finance art, refusing to exhibit her works in museums that continue to accept poisoned donations. Actions, demonstrations, denunciations. She and other committed people, often victims or relatives of victims, brought long, grueling court cases. The Sackler family came out on top after four years of litigations in return for a large sum of money to settle the lawsuit. But in 2021, a court challenged this immunity. And in parallel with the legal action, Nan and her gang are asking museums to remove the names of murderer donors from their dedicated spaces. The museums give in, or rather resist. They give in to Nan and her fighters and resist the arrogance and power of money. The greatest victory and recognition for Nan Art stands up to the indiscriminate fire that killed 500,000 people in the United States between 1999 and 2018. In many ways, Nan embodies resistance to the obscenity of the world around her. But perhaps the real story lies in her older sister Barbara's wish to protect Nan from their, her mother's madness, a resistance for which she paid dearly. Barbara shed her blood for her sister, who in return gives us all the beauty of the world through her lens as an artist and her struggle as a human being. Nan reveals through her lens and her political actions what we cannot or do not want to see. She knows only too well that we can be caught individually or collectively in movements of splitting and denial. The title of Laura Potra's films, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, Shed, is what her sister Barbara says when confronted with a Rorschach test during one of her stays in a psychiatric hospital. The film produces an incriminating medical report against her parents, who wrongly locked her up and probably drove her to suicide. In the next film sequence, 
Nan films her parents with great tenderness. And we understand that she is unable to reconcile these two images of human beauty and ugliness. Artists reveal the world to us, but they too are sometimes caught up in their own blind spots. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. And our next speaker is Elisabetta Marchiori from Italy. Thank you, Cordelia, and thank you all for your presence. Uh, my talk entitled Reflection, a film about the resistance of the mind in the line of fire, focuses on cinema, specifically on a film, a reflection, by Ukrainian director Valentin Vazianovich, presented in 2021 at the 17th Venice International Film Festival. And among the material, you can be found a montage of three scenes from this film, but now is available for streaming on Amazon Prime and other platforms. I would like to start with a quote from the French director, Eric Romer. The mission of cinema is turn turn, is to turn our gaze towards aspects of the world we do not want to see. And it is certainly not the role of war cinema to make the audience understand the war, nor to heal ignorance of history. However, the power of the images flowing on the screen in a dark movie theater prevents us from closing our eyes to the pain of others. Cinema can become a form of resistance enhancing the ability to think in the face of the horrors of war compared to the incessant stream of the images of atrocities broadcast nonstop by television and spread virally by social networks. Regardless of the ethical value of such images, they risk creating habit, detachment and apathy causing us to lose our sense of compassion for people who suffer. They are images that blind rather than make us see better, and they also cloud our ability to think as psychoanalysts. In the film Reflection, the scenario is the Donbass War, which began in 2014 as the prelude to the so-called Special Operation the invasion of war launched in the February 2022. As of February 2024, after two years, not only has the war in Ukraine not ceased, but it seems to have infected the world, renewing conflicts that had long been dormant, such as the dramatic escalation between Israel and Palestine. The title of the film is already very evocative, on the one hand, it refers to the reflections of the war in the people's lives and psyches. On the other, it asks difficult questions of the audience, soliciting opening of thought and the reflections about what is inhuman, what is deeply human in war. This film shows the strength of creativity and renewal and stands as a front of resistance to the force of destructiveness and alienation, investigating the possibility of making sense of what seems meaningless in a kind of psychoanalytic elaboration. The main characters are a 10-year-old girl and her two fathers, fraternal friends, who both left for the for for war front the biological father who survives, and the stepfather who loses his life. Frame after frame, reflection after reflection, each character and each object questioned by the camera releases a meaning. Each image reflects something else and, they, and make us wonder what atrocities, what death, what suffering we are not shown. This film freezes the time of war in an infinite and exhausting present, obliterating and conditioning people's lives, 
and places it in the depth of the human being where the inhuman takes the place of the human. The sequences in which there are large windows recur throughout the film, both a symbol of distance between the observer and the observed and as a symbol of the psychic resistance of the mind in the line of fire, in a protective and creative sense. And then there is the broken glass, which refers to a risk, namely that the individual, in the face of horror, not only activate the denial, but also more archaic defense mechanisms, such as dissociation and fragmentation. The first part of the film is a depiction of war. The scenes follow one another at a slow but inexorably pressing rhythm, full of silences and noises, sounds, shouts, and few words. There is no music. The shots are static. The images freeze in painting of cold and dark tones to expose the scarred bodies. The spaces are the claustrophobic ones of the tension and torture cells, or outdoors in desolate, agoraphobic non places. The narration in the second part of the film is more fluid. The war is not displayed, but its consequences can be seen in the protagonist's body stiffened by the pain and in the sadness of their looks, which come alive again in mutual contact. The shattered windows disappear, but not the reflections. The story develops around the imprint of the body of a pigeon that crashed violently, deceived by the reflection of the sky, on the window of the survivor's father's house, in the presence of his daughter. That beautiful and terrifying wing form is the reflection of the trauma. The death of the pigeon, which mirrors the death of the little girl's stepfather, transformed the film into a story about the relationship between father and daughter, involved together in grieving the loss of a loved one. In the end, there are still other reflections, those of the sound of the footsteps of our beloved ones, those present and alive, as well as those absent and dead. In fact, we are on a theater stage and the characters, one by one, come forward in close-up, looking into the camera, their backs to the empty audience. They have to recognize who is walking behind them by listening to the sound of their footsteps. It is a kind of theater therapy where distances are lost and human beings come together again to reconstruct the, the inner world through emotional bonds. This footstep can be recognized through attentive and authentic emotional listening to the good enough relationships, consolidating in pain and allowing to resist and involve. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Elisabetta. And our next speaker will be Julie Jaffe Nagel from the United States. Thank you, Cordelia. Thank you to my colleagues on the panel and thank you to the audience who is listening today. My title is Music and Mind in the Line of Fire. And um, I'll begin. Violence, unrest, and human suffering are currently erupting in many areas of the world. In Civilization and Its Discontents, written in 1930, Freud claimed, quote, the element of truth which people are so ready to disavow is that men are not gentle creatures, unquote. At some time in our lives, suffering and unrest have invaded the mind of each of us, quote, gentle creatures, unquote, who have been intrapsychically assaulted from within and without. Music can be a powerful balm and resistance to brutal aggression and is the focus of my comments today. 
Trained as a classical musician, a psychologist, and a psychoanalyst, mm -hmm. I am curious about my internal life, the emotional lives of others, and the inner workings of music. For example, why did Leonard Bernstein's Second Symphony, particularly the mosque movement, comfort me immediately after the heartbreaking, untimely death of my mother? Why has the Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto provided comfort, assuaged sadness, made me feel happy, joyful, and strong, and sometimes evoked a melancholy I did not understand? Why did many members of the American Psychoanalytic Association share when we had town hall meetings during the pandemic that music brought them comfort during a frightening time in 2020 before we had no vaccines to defend us against the ravages of COVID? As an analyst, I listen to the verbal sounds and the words of my patients. I have become increasingly attuned to how much music helps both them and me experience affects which convey aural, A-U-R-A-L, responses that neither my patients nor I can articulate verbally. I also realize how music has served me and my clinical work as I listen to the sounds and silences of my patients, the tones of their voice, and the songs they sing about memories which augment or elicit their verbal associations. Sometimes I experience a music composition in my countertransference that comes to my mind and informs the comments I make to my patient. Music in general, and specifically the piano early in my life, became a transitional object to maintain connection with the people and places in my life that I have loved dearly and lost sadly. Attachment to one's mother or mother country also can be embedded musically in the mind and soul of people who are trapped in the line of fire, both externally and within their mind. Why does music affect us so strongly? This discussion is complex and can be found elsewhere. For brevity today, I feel attuned to the proposal that music sounds the way emotions feel, and the claim that music represents a simulacrum of inner life. Music can evoke and integrate nonverbal and pre-representational unconscious imagos and sensations with verbal and representational concepts explored through the tones of talk. Contrary to Freud's denial of his acoustic sensibilities, which I question as possibly defensive, is the idea that music, according to philosopher Theodore Lips, shifted the focus that Freud was developing about a representational unconscious in his dream books to pre-representational, non-verbal, affective factors in psychic life. For Lips, the aesthetic of music was a central feature of psychic life, irrespective of conscious and unconscious representational factors. In fact, music ultimately gave rise to them. Neither the analyst, musician, nor the listener needs to be trained in music nor psychoanalytic theory to experience powerful emotions, both joy and pain in response to music. The formal structures of music and psychoanalytic concepts provide a vibrant point of investigation and intersection between music theory and theories of mind through their shared principles of one, multiple function, two, displacement, and three, infinite representations. Together, music and mind can contribute to a nuanced understanding of intrapsychic processes and transformation of a mind in conflict or a mind on fire. Psychoanalysts and musicians as cultural ambassadors can and already have transported psychoanalytic concepts into the community beyond the walls of each individual discipline. I invite you today in this unsettling time in our history to reflect and explore how you think about intersections between mind and music. 
What music would you share with others as a cultural ambassador? How would you engage with other people through music? I conclude with a thought and a challenge. How can psychoanalysts and musicians individually, in groups, and together, create, transport music and psychoanalytic knowledge into the community beyond the walls of our consulting rooms and concert stages. My experience has shown me and others that the intersection of the aural, A-U-R-A-L, nonverbal, musical, and oral, O-R-A-L, verbal, and words, the intersection of these roads to the unconscious intersect and have the potential meaningfully to promote the tones and talk of peace. Thank you. So our final speaker now uh, is Andreas Mittermeier from Austria. Thank you. Okay, I'll start right away. Uh, the title of my presentation uh, is The Resistance of Music the music of resistance. So it's also about music. And I'm using the example of the Ukrainian national anthem. I'd like to elaborate further on something Julie addressed in her presentation when she pointed out that music has a tremendous evocative power. And when she raised the question, what it is about music that it moves, affects us so reliably. I'd like to add another reverse question, namely, what are we doing with or to the music? Or in other words, how do we use or misuse this particular, the musical object? The musical object can be invested with libido. It can be used as a means of unification, of connection. It can be identified with the ego ideal, but it can also be used in the service of resistance, both intrapsychic and cultural resistance. I find it striking that music seems to have a unique applicability as such instrument of resistance. Think of the genre of resistance music, songs of slavery and emancipation, partisan songs, protest pop songs, and so on. Music can therefore at times also become a weapon against internal and external threats, but also regrettably as a weapon employed in a destructive, sometimes even perverse way. But first, let me start with an example of the first category, music in the service of unification. At a moment of urgent need for individual as well as cultural or collective defense. Um, many of you have probably uh, come across videos of performances of the Ukrainian anthem um, in a variety of versions and different contexts, filmed especially during the first months of the, of the war, played, for example, by soldiers around a bomb crater, sung by the Odessa Opera Choir in front of the Opera House, or performed by a little refugee girl, in front of a great audience in a stadium. I think it was in uh, Poland. Um, these clips went around the world uh, through social media. Um, Roger Kennedy offers in his book a summary of the functions and effects of music. Just to name a few, he says music can create a sense of wholeness. It can, without question, rouse us into battle. It can excite us with rhythms and harmonies, bring us into intimate connection with each other, soothe us, and it plays a vital role in the ritual of a community. All these effects can be quite easily observed in the mentioned videos. The performances are very powerful and moving for the performers as well as for the spectators. And certainly not least because of the specific formal aesthetic nature of such hymn-like musical works. The majesty of major chords, the sublimity, uh, a very self-confident melodic voice that has a recognition value, grounded by a dynamizing marching rhythm. 
it allows an immediate emotional response and resonance. But we are also dealing with a field where music and politics intersect. Music, which is used for political purposes, can, as Brenner states, serve the resistance of the group against persecution, identity formation, but also the demonstration of power, distraction and concealment. We see very clearly in this list that music use can pursue very, very conflicting goals and spring from very con uh, discrepant mo motives. I'll elaborate further on that. Firstly, music can, as the example of the Ukrainian anthem shows, serve as a constructive unifying ideal, or more precise, a shared musical object where certain ideals such as the cherished country can be projected to, and its ritualized performance may be understood as a crucial strategy of cultural defense. A process of libidinal investment is involved, but we could also think of an investment of lethic drive energy, a term Cordelia Schmidt-Hellerau uh, used for the designation of the drive energy of the preservational drive. The beloved country and its people are to be preserved and sheltered. Um, furthermore, music is, is a fundamentally physical experience, which creates something like a second skin, a protective sound envelope, as Didier Ancier called it. Secondly, the at times excessively performed song can uh, serve as a means of manic reparation, for example, in the face of real bombardment. It may involve other resistance strategies such as omnipotence and denial, and can be seen as a necessary protective or preservative strategy of the mind to overcome paralyzing fear in a moment of great internal and external danger. And thirdly, sadly, history also taught us that music can be corrupted, corrupted and instrumentalized for very, very destructive purposes. The domination of the paranoid schizoid cosmos, the workings of the death drive, or a process of diffusion of drives, the dissolution of the fusion of sex and aggression during dangerous regressive states often accounts for this perversion of music. Anthems or hymns are then being misused as a weapon in the service of destruction or envious retaliation. Retaliation, for example, as a reaction to fantasized attacks on one's grandiosity. In propaganda, music becomes a tool for seduction, hypnotization, and manipulation of the masses to march for a corrupt leader or ideal. Singing those anthems or patriotic songs um, is in any case a mass psychological event. If we think further with Sigmund Freud, it promotes the identification of mass individuals with each other, as well as the identification with an ideal, for example, the homeland, the head of state, and so on. The ego ideal of the individual is surrendered to the ideal or leader and the ideal object is put in its place for the defense of life and limb, in fact, temporarily necessary processes. The collective musical experience then provides a ritual framework and acts as a catalyst for these processes. Freud is not able to recognize any creative aspects in mass movements, but forcefully demonstrates the regressive dangerous side. He has the dull, suggestible mass before his eyes and sees the autonomy of the individual undermined. Today, however, we also work with the notion of regression in the service of the ego, recognizing that for collective socio-political innovations, revolutions or defenses, as well as for creative achievements, such a temporary dissolution of otherwise relatively fixed ego boundaries is needed. In the context of Ukrainian defense, the community music making can be understood as a temporary 
regression in the service of self and object preservation, a force mobilizing regression that also saves the ego from traumatic disintegration and flooding fear. Music literally becomes vitally important. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you all. Uh, I want to share also with the audience that we as a culture committee um, uh, learned a lot and enjoyed discussing this panel uh, and uh, the contributions that you have heard. Um, as you see, uh, resistance uh, is not the only but a very important uh, function of cultural expressions. And uh, also Patrick Siegwald in the question and answer uh, function uh, reminded us that psychoanalysis itself also has such an important uh, role to play. And as often in repressive regimes, uh, this function is uh, uh, tried to uh, obliterate or squash. We know that uh, in particular literature has taken up uh, this role of uh, resistance. You may, for instance, also think, of course, of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Nobel, Nobel Prize winning uh, author who wrote this important book, uh, The Gulag Archipelago. Uh, and who was stripped of his uh, Russian citizenship and uh, sent abroad. Um, or uh, I remembered, uh, for instance, uh, uh, how the mini series on television in Germany came out called Holocaust. It was in 1978, um, so more than 30 years after the end of the Second World War. And this series, uh, even though criticized uh, uh, from uh, serious uh, angles, did uh, lead to a flood of documentaries and, um, and portraits and um, uh, uh, discussions about the Nazi time uh, that lasted for years. And it made the notion of Holocaust also uh, a publicly known notion. You see that these expressions of uh, culture can have uh, an important influence uh, in the awareness that we have about the wrongs uh, that societies at times produce. Um, it is sort of like the uh, Emile Zola said, always a bit of J'accuse, I accuse uh, the wrongs that I experienced or see. Uh, I invite the audience now to uh, chime in and uh, let us know on the Q&A function that you will find at the bottom of uh, your screen. Q&A is noted. And uh, um, while we are waiting for the uh, first questions to come in, uh, I would like to invite the panelists uh, if they want to uh, raise their hands and also uh, comment on their colleagues' uh, presentations or add to what they have told us. Yes. Yeah, Claudia. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I, was, I just wanted to uh, chime in a bit on uh, Patrick's uh, uh, remark in the uh, Q&A. It's interesting that he reminds us that psychoanalysis in itself it's a, is a movement of resistance. And I was remembering how he mentions uh, the uh, Nazism and uh, how at the time psychoanalysis, of course, uh, uh, suffered uh, as uh, everybody else involved somehow in, the, in that uh, part of history, but it survived and uh, not only survived, it, uh, it immigrated and it kept growing and developing and finding new uh, ramifications, so to speak. I was also thinking about the, our pandemic times now, how psychoanalysis 
uh, was able to psychoanalysis, of course, I mean, us, I mean, psychoanalysts uh, were able to, I think most of the colleagues that I know had such a strong urge to continue working and uh, thinking and exchanging. And uh, it was in a very uh, opposite way of uh, just being conf confined. Of course, somehow we had some options uh, that others didn't. I mean, they're, they're online and so on. But I, I felt it was so strong the urge the urge to to survive at this time, and perhaps because of our character of uh, resistance, as, as he uh, points out here. Yeah, thank you, Claudia, for elaborating on uh, Patrick Siegwald's comment. I think this is very important. And it gives me the opportunity to uh, say uh, a word to the work of the Culture Committee. Um, we, uh, our, our task and our aim is to encourage each of our own uh, creativity. So when we, for instance, uh, send you the little gifts that you receive every month, uh, you may have noticed, then uh, it is, of course, to uh, uh, to in, that you, we hope you enjoy them. It, they may puzzle you or uh, startle you, uh, but they will uh, touch on something that your mind will work on. And uh, it can do that because uh, culture speaks to all of us in different ways. Uh, one will notice this aspect, another will notice that aspect. But I do believe that in all those responses that you as a viewer, for instance, of these little gifts have, there is a bit of an unconscious resonance that uh, is, uh, is um, touched upon. Um, I remember when I was uh, uh, training as a psychoanalyst and when I was a candidate, uh, we were reminded time and again that we should lead, read fiction because Fiction, in fact, enriches our uh, mental life and it can stir our uh, availability, uh, ease our availability to the unconscious derivatives that uh, sneak in during the day or sneak in during the patient's uh, communications. And in that sense, uh, culture has a very important function for us, in particular, also as psychoanalysts when working with patients. Claudia? Yes, just uh, again, on this that you mentioned working with patients, uh, and I had in mind something to bring up from Julie's presentation. Uh, at the end, I think I have the, the impression that what our uh, talks have in common, of course, is this aspect of uh, uh, resistance that cultural actions can provide for, uh, let's say, difficult times or contents. Uh, at the end, Julie uh, uh, challenges us, asking, well, but how can we bring this then to outside the walls of our consulting rooms. And I was um, thinking uh, there was another moment in her panel that caught very much my attention when she says that with her patient, sometimes her uh, music comes to her mind. So it made me think that um, somehow music is part of her idiom with her patients. Uh, the other day I read that every pair has its own idiom, and we know that. So music is part of her idiom, and I was thinking uh, in my free association here, an idiom, we, we know it's common knowledge. I mean, the, the earlier we start learning another idiom, the better it is, more chances we have to uh, grow into it. So... I don't know if these, uh, how I can put this together, Julie, to, to place a question to you, but how can we, as early as possible, bring culture uh, to 
children, for instance, or to education. Yeah, thinking about uh, the ones, yeah. you know, growing up time. It, it's a very, thank you for the question. And um, it's a very big one, very broad one. It, I think we all have done that in a way this morning in speaking, but we're speaking to our colleagues. But to, as I mentioned, to go into the community just by being there and having a way of thinking about a topic that you might present on will be presented from your psychoanalytic perspective because you can't help it. You're a psych you are a psychoanalyst. You just don't do psychoanalysis. You mentioned something too about how the pandemic has allowed us to perhaps expand our way of working. And it, what we're doing this morning, I can't imagine being done too long ago and communicating not only with ourselves, but with, with um, non-analytic people and to give workshops or to uh, to get to expand our concept of what is psychoanalytic is it's in my mind it's more than just doing psychoanalysis i don't want to go on too long here because everybody has said something today that can make an impact on others by sharing it with others outside of the psychoanalytic consulting room if there's time i have an example of of I thought in music that although we can't play it today in person together, you can listen to it, but something that Andreas sparked in me, but I think I'll turn it over to other people to see what they think about. How do we get to be involved with other people who can absorb, even if they don't understand psychoanalytic principles, it's a different way of thinking than just problem solving. And it's a very elegant, way that absorbs non-verbally and verbally uh, from what what we can offer. Thank you, Julie. Uh, it's a very good point. And I think uh, what we as a culture committee offer is uh, uh, a focus on culture that we have in common uh, with uh, our patients, for instance. Uh, I just feel reminded of uh, uh, the fact that I have a picture of a landscape hanging at the end of the couch. And many uh, of my patients at some point said, this looks exactly like the landscape where I grew up. <laughs> and it's not possible that it is uh, uh, basically an identical image of their individual landscape, but they see something through the art of this picture that uh, relates to their own experience. And I think uh, in music, it may be just uh, like that. Uh, the musical object as such is uh, uh, very uh, specific. But what each of us does and what each of us can revive in oneself uh, is individual and helps uh, all together, I think, to strengthen the voice of resistance, for instance. Mm -hmm. Elisabetta, you want to say something? Yes, thank you. I, I like to... Um, I like uh, to... Thank you, Marilisa, uh, for uh, the comment about uh, the uh, the movie. And uh, I think that uh, it's amazing how some films are almost uh, prophetic sometimes. And the, when we watch a film in the, in the dark room on, in, the, in the theater, we cannot look away. Not change the channel and still remain indelibly imprinting in the memory and become more real than fiction sometimes with a great potential to produce thought and to stimulate the desire for thought and comprehension and knowledge. And I think cinema is an important uh, culture um, stimulus uh, for to to talk uh, as a psychoanalyst.
Yes, I think cinema is uh, has a particular function in that. Um, maybe because as long as we see uh, a movie, uh, we cannot look away as you so uh, well described. And we feel uh, being in this world that is presented in the movie, uh, but is not presented in its raw um, material, but in a metabolized way. The movie maker has uh, included and integrated his understanding and his thinking in what he or she shows. And so it is a better way of confronting realities, even such harsh realities uh, like war. Um, may I read here uh, two of uh, the audience um, remarks? Uh, one says, uh, thank you for this excellent seminar on the creative culture. Yet uh, she, she wants to ask, it's Beth Kalish Weiss, she wants to ask about the omission of movement and dance as part of the group discussion. It often is the least discussed. Uh, this is also, is this also a resistance after all the senses that housed in the body, the moving body, that per precursors to verbal language as seen in children as communications. Please comment. Yes, uh, thank you, Beth, for uh, uh, bringing that up. It, it was not meant to uh, exclude or to be disregarded. This panel came about with, of course, each of our panelists had a particular focus or had a particular idea. So we did not cover everything. And uh, I do think uh, the cultural voices are uh, much broader. Uh, so uh, definitely dance uh, uh, and uh, performances of all kinds uh, are important here and to include to be included. I think a particular of, for instance, modern dance, uh, which can be quite jarring and revealing. Um, so uh, yes, it would have had a place uh, in our discussion had one of our me members uh, had an immediate or uh, deeper connection to that part of culture. There is another um, comment from of Mari Jim uh, is up. Sorry for not produce, pronouncing the, your name correct correctly. Thank you very much. I'm curious to know what elements uh, are in music, film, and so on that make them uh, can have these function. What are the elements that uh, give uh, cultural voices uh, the function of resistance? Is there any panelist who wants to respond to that? Uh, Julie? If, if I can say this briefly, because this is a huge question, a very important question that's just been raised. And I don't have the answer because I don't think there is one. And I think every one of us in our own disciplines and has a way to communicate. But musically, I see the overlaps, as I mentioned, multiple function. This is where I was going to compliment Andreas and, and what he was also indicating. In music and in analysis, we have similar concepts of like core conflicts that come into our office. Patients come in, they identify a problem, but that problem that they identify when we start to work with it expands over time to have many uh, tentacles, shall we say. It expands. There are many applications of that core conflict that are worked out over the course of an analysis. The same happens, I'm gonna speak just to music, but I'm sure others can speak to theirs. Um, that there, that in music you have a theme you hear in the beginning, and that is um, developed, which we develop in, I, mean, I use vocabulary here, developed over the course of a music uh, composition. And that can include conflict, dissonance, consonance, um, conflict resolution of sound, of thought, 
you can think in kind of a double speak here that there are these overlapping um, qualities and the ambiguity sometimes or not having an answer. One thing that comes to my mind is this is, I don't know if people know of John Cage, the composer who wrote a composition, a very famous one called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. And basically the performer comes on, there, is, there are YouTubes of this, comes on, sits at any instrument or in front of an orchestra and then does nothing for four minutes and 33 seconds. And the goal is to listen to whatever comes into your mind, like analysis. We all will hear this piece differently. We all hear all pieces differently, but this one is such a striking example. I have more, but I know, I'm know i sure other people have comments to this, but music and, and psychoanalysis are so involved with the internal response to what is heard and the similarities in things that we listen for beneath the melody or beneath the words. Patients will tell us something, but we hear and try and help them understand that there's more to it. Just like in music, there's more underneath the melody. That's that's the quickest answer, and it's a long one, so I'll stop. Yeah, thank you, Julie. That's very rich, and I uh, only want to uh, add here that music, like words, uh, uh, is heard by our unconscious. Uh, what what you say in in an analytic treatment and how you say it with what kind of voice reaches the patient differently and so we are affected we can not not be affected by uh, music uh, and you see this also in films for instance where the music often tells it's the story the accompanying music when a person walks across a field can be joyous or sad or uh, uh, transmit a feeling of uh, uh, loneliness uh, or on the contrary, uh, adventurousness. Um, in that sense, uh, it's also important uh, as uh, Elisabetta noticed the silences in, mu in movies when there is no... Uh, uh, music uh, and uh, as an example spontaneously comes to mind in this movie cast away uh, this was one of the few maybe uh, the only movie where there was no music at all we, we only heard the the sounds of nature no music and so we were basically uh, challenged to uh, to uh, understand the emotional impact of this one person uh, dropped for a long time alone on an island and how he tried to keep his sanity by creating an object with who he could uh, communicate. So uh, I, I think music has a, an enormous place uh, in, in us. Yeah, uh, Andreas, please. I just wanted to to uh, add a few thoughts. Um, one colleague um, was talking about dance and the physical um, aspect, and I wanted to um, add some thoughts uh, because when listening to all the other uh, presentations, I thought, um, I mean, first, I think we have to differentiate because some of us uh, talk talked about people being creative and um, being artistically involved and others being recipients of uh, music or uh, or art. And I think there is a big difference. I am the one to dance. I am the one to, uh, to make music. Or am I just receiving like you usually do when you are watching a film? And I was thinking... Um, especially when it's about making music and um, painting or whatever, it's, uh, it's an act of uh, creating something like a, a second skin, as I said, with, with maybe also with this singing of anthems. And, and I was thinking um, that it applies to many uh, uh, art forms. This, uh, it's a very physical 
thing. Uh, the words uh, create somehow a, an, a, an envelope. Um, in a good psychoanalytic hour, um, this happens. The music creates something like a, an envelope and the second skin, which is especially um, necessary when there, there are so many external and internal threats. And I think there is the symbolic uh, expression of art, but there is also this very, very physical um, encounter we have. The resonance, not just uh, the symbolic resonance, but the, the actual resonance. That is also one aspect um, that I think is very important, and the the, the colleague uh, touched upon this this very uh, physical quality um, of of uh, culture and of art. I just wanted to add that. It's a nice uh, um, reminder the the envelope um, and the physical aspect of uh, sound, uh, which uh, brings to my mind the obvious uh, the. Uh, the baby in the womb her hears already the sounds uh, of uh, the parents' voices. Uh, so it can probably be thought of as the very first uh, uh, of uh, the impressions and in contact with the outer world. Did I see right? Uh, Johanna, did you want to say something? No, then Julie, please. Uh, building on everything people are saying, including the questions I've seen come in, which are excellent that Cordelia music, I agree, go, it can cut right through the, the uh, conscious and go to the unconscious. I think that's one of the benefits of the sound without words that comes into our mind and perhaps initiate some kind of thought or memory that can become conscious. Um, the first language is so important in the womb, the rhythm, the movement, there you go, it starts. And then in early in birth, the communication between parent and child to develop a sense of competence and that if you cry, someone will attend to you or won't. It begins pre-birth and continues in the way I think about it throughout life. And uh, um, yeah, it, it's it's all around if we only become aware of it. It's not any particular composition. It, it's what compositions or what sounds you hear. But um, I'm just underscoring what I'm yeah. hearing. It makes me very excited to hear the conversation that's occurred this mm -hmm. month. I have a contribution here from Miriam Voran. She says, um, the discussion has me thinking that some art form, forms aim more to document a disturbing reality, as Valeria's example of photography. Some art forms are more evocative, as Julie's example of music. And uh, she wonders if we could comment on how these dimensions at, uh, are each linked to resistance. Uh, Valeria, do you want to say something? Yes, I, I would like to add and maybe answer this question. And it is, I think it has to do with, with something we have been, we mentioned that has to do with children. When I, when I first thought of this, I was, I really thought of things that had impact me. And one of the things that, uh, as I tell in my uh, in what I wrote, is that I was three or four years old, and I remember this picture as being something very disruptive, because I I always looked at these National Geographic pictures with a lot of you know colors and nice flowers, and suddenly this comes, and I I really I think in that. Being a child, I couldn't understand. I understand later on. So I think that sometimes reality comes also um, in the form of art, but it's also necessary. And I think that what I also wanted to outline is that these two people that had, well, you know, Ute, Nick Ute already had a brother that died as a photographer and, you know, 
Xi Kim, Kim Pook also had a very, you know, a story of, of many, they lost lots of things, but they could together create something for good and out of something that was quite a terrible reality. And I think it, it's, that's one of the things we all want to show maybe that the, the, the act of resistance um, sometimes is um, an act of, of, of life. And I think that, um, well, it's that's important. And I, it, I think it, it makes us think of both parts of trying to integrate reality, but of being able to be creative too. And I think that, that's, that there's a bridge between those reality and creativity in that sense. I, I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, I think it's important and it's, it's a very important question to, to, to try to join that artists show some kind of reality always, I think. It's, sometimes it's more it's hidden, but um, I think they always show reality. Yes, Valeria, and in part uh, by showing it them, uh, they do not only document, uh, but they create new answers uh, in various forms. And there's a, a lovely a comment by uh, Mir Miriam. Who says? Who suggests that uh, we put could perhaps say uh, the expressions of cultures, uh, culture, and psychoanalysis both allow uh, a kind of safe regression. Uh, this reculé pour mieux sauter, a regression in the service of the ego, uh, as it was called, uh, being touched deeply, touched, and then producing something new often combining uh, various forms of uh, culture, uh, music with image uh, uh, or in poetry, image with uh, the, the rhythm. The rhythm was also mentioned in one of the comments. Elisabeth, oh, Claudia? Did uh, Lisa want to speak? Oh, yeah. No, I was just thinking, um... Of course, I mean it's. Uh, I think it may be obvious, but I wanted to to outline that our choices of uh, cultural um, expressions are not. Uh, the, the, I mean, there are no favorite ones, so to speak, uh, except perhaps for Julie, who is an, such an expert in music. But uh, we had to pick some, and um, many. Others were left out, of course, like uh, painting and uh, sculpturing and uh, so many other forms. Uh, perhaps because we were more concerned about the uh, the the again the function function of the the cultural act, and in this way, uh, the transformative uh, function of culture. Thinking a bit about the the movie that Cordelia mentioned, uh, reminded us the uh, Castaway. Somehow he, I mean, the character was not content with the reality that was given there for him. I mean, the natural uh, state of his reality: uh, the sea, the horizon, and he alone. And he creates uh, William Wilson or William, uh, his colleague, his friend there, the object. Uh, so there is this transformative action that transforms reality inside and outside. Then I'm not sure we can divide it so much, uh, uh, disagreeing a little bit with Andreas. I'm not sure how passive or how uh, when we receive art or culture or how we when we do it. There is a, an author here in Brazil, he uh, Figueiredo, thinking on Christopher Bowler's transformational object. He says, a painting, when a painter paints a painting, there's something that has happened with him, the painter. But the paint, painting will, will only achieve its purpose when somebody else sees it. And it, will trans, it may transform 
the other one as well. So this chain of culture going on, which of course is not always good, we are not idealizing it, there are cultural mean objects that are created by the human kind. That's just what I wanted to say too. Thank you, Claudia. I have uh, three interesting comments now in the Q&A section and I will read them uh, all uh, one after the other, uh, inviting uh, our panelists to respond to it. We are a bit at the end of our time, but uh, we can run a few minutes over. So Ellen Wieland says, if art has a value of working through experiences, isn't it already a resistance? Ed Tronic uh, says, following up on the fetus and the maternal heartbeat, I wonder how music and movement in particular sculpt the child's embodied systems, which still exist in an adult and shape our experience and meaning of music and movement. It seems to me our adult words do not capture our experience. Mm -hmm. And Alicia Rizzetto says, I'm thinking about the integrative function of the music and the artistic expressions or literature, depending on their organized form, which facilitate the mirroring function and so integration of splitting subjective parts. So uh, there is... Again, music uh, is at the center of uh, our discussion. Does anybody want to comment uh, other than agreeing with these uh, three comments? Just want to say not only music. Uh, Licia, our colleague, also says literature. I understand she's uh, bringing about the this, uh, the, the, what she says, uh, they organize for, facilitate the mirroring function, integration of splitted subject parts. I think this is so interesting. And in my understanding, uh, arts in general do that. Right. No, I meant to, uh, only to say the, the discussion, our discussion focuses a little bit more on music here. Uh, that doesn't mean that other forms and expressions of culture do not uh, serve similar important functions. All right, uh, we are at the end of our time. Uh, I thank the panelists in particular for their contributions. And I thank uh, all of you who uh, uh, thought with us and contributed uh, silently or uh, by writing your comments. And uh, I hope you have a nice cultural experience over the weekend. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.